Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the privilege it is to be here this morning. We ask that your presence would come and minister to us today. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We are in awe of you. Love nothing more than us to walk away from here more like you, more in love with you, pursuing you with everything that we have. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. Would you be speaking to us this morning? Would you be ministering to us? Would you draw us closer to you, more in love with you, more in pursuit of you? May you be glorified through everything that happens this morning. We love you, Jesus. Amen. We're in a series called Encounter. Who's enjoyed this series? I've loved it. I love listening to Jess last week. I love seeing everyone with their phones out taking pictures of all the points that she had. It was just a greater message about having wells in your home and how you're intentional about cultivating those. It doesn't matter if you didn't have that. You can have that. That's what I loved about what Jess was talking about. It doesn't matter what happened in your past that you can change what happens. And today, the next one in that series I want to talk about, it says on the screen, embrace the uncomfortable. Oh, you hear hesitation. <laughs> Who likes being uncomfortable? A couple. Hopefully more hands are raised by the end of the morning. Embracing the uncomfortable is something that God has been doing in me and it probably took way too long. Does anyone have those things where God tries to teach you a lesson and it just you keep pushing up against it and you keep having all sorts of excuses? That was me when it comes to embracing the uncomfortable. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through what it was for me, but also we're going to look at the Bible and seeing that I believe that being uncomfortable is where Jesus calls us to be. I think that's where Jesus is. I think that's where he wants us. And I want you to get that out of the day. That maybe you'll be willing to take maybe a little step forward, dip your toe in the water of what it means to be uncomfortable for Jesus. Now, as I reflected on my journey, embracing the uncomfortable, I realized it probably took me 20 years to go through that. And as I reflected on that, I thought of the Truman Show. Anyone seen The Truman Show? Yeah. Probably many of you. I just re-watched it uh, the other day, just thinking, as I was preparing, it's like, oh, my life was like The Truman Show. Now, in The Truman Show, there's this guy, this, the main star is called Truman Burbank. And if you're not familiar with it, the, show, the movie is about a reality show, and Truman Burbank is the star in this reality show. They've created this whole world around Truman Burbank. He doesn't realise that he's actually in a show. And so he's born with everyone else in his world are all actors. And so when you watch the, the movie, you see him, that all these actors, and it's all staged, and there's a director saying, go here, do this, and his whole world is scripted. You see even the hilarious parts where you've got people trying to usher him into places with sponsors behind him and things like that. It's this whole world that Truman doesn't realise he's in a reality world. Now what happens as he goes on the journey, he starts to question things. He sees things re repeating. He sees things where he can't venture outside of the island that he's on. And he realizes maybe there is more. Maybe the world I've known, there's something else more to it. Now, what the director, the director in the movie says this. I think it's profound. He says, we accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Let me say that again. We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Now, most of us accept the reality, all of us accept the reality of the world that we grow up in. And so we understand that as being normal. It doesn't matter how wonderful or dysfunctional it was, we all accept that reality as normal until we come across people that have a different reality. That's what happens, and we start questioning our own reality. Now, I grew up in what I'm terming was a Truman-type world. It was a Christian-loving family. I went to a Christian church. I went to a private Christian school. 
I had Christian friends and I had all my social engagements were with Christians. It was in this city. Everything in my world, although I wouldn't change it, so don't get me wrong, I wouldn't change it, but the reality, that's the world that I grew up in. I didn't know anything different. I didn't know there was another world out there. I didn't know Rockingham wasn't full of wonderful, loving Christian people. I just didn't realise that. And it even ventured into part of my adulthood. I was blind because you only, only question your world when you come across others. And then when you're confined into this bubble of loving Christian community, you actually don't realise that there is brokenness out there. And what I think as I was thinking on my journey, it, that was my reality for probably 27 years of my life. And as I reflected, especially just in reflecting on the Truman Show, I think what happened is brokenness might appear, but in Christian communities, it's shunted down. It's hidden. Has anyone heard that term, the Sunday best? Everyone puts in their Sunday best, and the reality in my world is they put on their Sunday best Monday to Sunday. Every single day, people were pretending that there was nothing wrong in their life. So I didn't come across people that had addictions. I didn't feel like I came across people that were in poverty or struggling or brokenness. It just didn't exist. I think the reality is it did exist. And like in the, if you've seen the Truman Show where all of a sudden people start coming onto the set and they're trying to tell Truman the reality of his world and then all the, the buses will come in front and the people will come and then the runners will have a group and they'll take the person out of there and peace returns to normal. And so I think the reality is that in that my upbringing, churches didn't realise how to deal with brokenness. And so it was covered up because you didn't want to be rejected, so you covered it up yourself, or it was shunted off saying, we don't know how to deal with you, you don't really feel accepted in that community, and so off you go. And I think that's the reality of still many churches today. Paradox is very different to that. We actually embrace brokenness. And I think the reality of most people that come into Paradox, if you're relatively new, be prepared at some point your brokenness will come out. You can't hide in this community. You're not going to be forced to bring it out, but the reality is when you feel accepted and loved, you realise there's things in your life that need to be dealt with, and this is a place that is safe and loving and can help you in that place. So that was my life for 27 years. I'm grateful for it. I wouldn't want it as in any other way, but the reality, if that becomes my life as an adult, I think I've got it wrong. If being in a Christian bubble in a commission community, not realising what is outside that world, if I spend the rest of my life doing that, I think I've got it wrong. And I think too many of us Christians, too many of us churches, unfortunately do that for the rest of our lives. We try and control. So like in the Truman Show, they were kind of trying to control everything around them. And I think as Christians, we try and control our environment. I don't think we try and control our environment because we're afraid of sin or afraid of temptation. I think we control our environment because we like comfort. We like to be around nice people. We like to be around people like us. And so we control our life around ourselves to make it safe and comfortable. And I don't think that's what Jesus wants, and I'm going to share with that today. So nothing in my upbringing or my childhood was fake. It was just controlled. As I said, just I honour my childhood. It was controlled to the point that loved me. But if that control happens in an adult where I get to, where I'm actually supposed to be on mission with God, then that's what needs to change. So as Christians, we can and we do live in a comfortable world. But as followers of Jesus, however, it's not supposed to be that way. Did you hear the difference? As Christians, we can live in comfort. And as followers of Jesus, we can't. Now, when I think of what happened to Peter in the boat, so there's this story. Peter's one of the disciples of Jesus, 12 people that got to spend about three years learning from Jesus himself. So Peter and the disciples, they're in a boat, and Jesus is not with them. And so they go out in the water. They're heading out on the water, and all of a sudden they see Jesus coming. First they thought he's a ghost. They realize all of a sudden it's Jesus. And what does Peter do? So there's got 12 disciples. 11 of them are quite comfortable sitting in that boat. Peter realizes, hey, if that's you, Jesus, that's where I'm meant to be. And as un you know, walking on water is not comfortable. Anyone find it comfortable? Not many of us. So walking on water is not comfortable. He knows that's where Jesus is and that's where he's meant to be. And so his response to Jesus is, hey, Jesus, 
would you come? Would you let me come out to you? Jesus, just tell me to come and I'm there. And Jesus responds with come. So Peter gets out of the water and he starts walking on the water. Now, we picture it as him having this glorious time of dancing on the water towards Jesus. The reality is he's walking probably in hesitation the whole time, completely uncomfortable of what's actually happening. But he knows if Jesus said it, that's where he's meant to be. And so what happens is Jesus is out in that uncomfortable place. And I think that's where we're meant to be. Now, we have this glory talk about, hey, we're meant to go and walk on the water and things like that. If you've been around Christian churches for a while, everyone talks about this glory spot. The reality is walking on water is super uncomfortable. And that's what we find happens to Peter. So all of a sudden, the moment he's focused on Jesus, he's able to walk through that uncomfortable place, completely safe with Jesus, but completely uncomfortable The moment he turns his eyes off Jesus and he focuses on the wind and the waves that's going on, he realizes, actually, I'm unsafe and I'm uncomfortable and I want to get back in that boat, and then he starts sinking. And so Jesus comes and rescues him. It's the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, the moment he settled for comfort like the disciples in the boat, was the moment that he wasn't where he was supposed to be. The moment he embraced the uncomfortability was where he was safe. The moment he took his eyes off Jesus was the moment that uncomfortableness with the unsafeness caused him to start sinking. I think we're supposed to be out there in the uncomfortable with Jesus. I think our whole life is supposed to be uncomfortable like that. And I think it's time as churches, as Christians, we're willing to actually step out of that boat and say, that's where I'm meant to be. And please don't take this as that cliche message because I'm tired of that one, of stepping out the boat. It is uncomfortable. It is often not exciting. It is often costly. It's often the place where you don't want to be. But that's where Jesus calls us to be. Now, when I think of that word comfortable, I think of a prophetic word that our family was given. So... If ever you get a prophetic word, make sure you get out your phone, you record it. If anyone is praying for you, I encourage you, get out your phone and record it because it's easy in the moment to feel great and then you forget what was spoken. And so I've been taught to get out my phone. And so this day, um, we got out our phones and the prophetic word was recorded. And just prior to this word, the preacher was speaking and he's sharing this message and then he stops and he calls out our family and gives us a word. So I put together a video from just a private YouTube video, and we've watched it probably 50 times or more. Um, It just continues to be encouragement to us. But the first 20 seconds of it is not the prophetic word, and it's the end of what he's talking about. And he talks about being comfortable and safe. And this is what he says. God's presence is the safest place, but that doesn't mean you're called to be comfortable. You are completely safe with God, that that doesn't translate to being comfortable. Because often we think when it comes to following Jesus that being comfortable and safe is where we're meant to be. If I look at every person in the Bible that was said yes to God, say Old Testament, and they're saying yes to God and everything he has for them, everyone in the New Testament that's following Jesus with everything they have, I can't think of one person, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't think of one person that lived a comfortable life. Not one. I can't think of anyone in the modern era that has lived completely for God, that lived a comfortable life. If anything, being uncomfortable is the defining thing, your willingness to go through uncomfortability is the defining thing that says that you've said yes to Jesus. And we're going to talk about that more. Peter chose the safety and the comfort of the boat rather than being where he was supposed to be, which was the safety and uncomfortableness of being with Jesus. Now, the crew is one of our ministries at Paradox. I looked back through all of my message, finding out what was the first day I went to the crew. It was back the 19th of November, 2018. So about four and a half years ago was the first day I walked through the door of the crew. Now, this was a Monday lunch. So I have this Christian bubble, Christian community, Christian everything, and I'm walking through the door of what is a community meal for the homeless and struggling. I was as far out of my comfort zone as I could get. I was so uncomfortable in the the week leading up to that. 
I was thinking of every excuse possible for me not to be in that place and to not walk through that door. It's funny how I think religion causes us to have excuses to bring us from uncomfortability back into comfort. That's what it does. We come up with these religious reasons for us to not step out of our comfort zone into the uncomfortable. And so I was coming up with these excuses. God, I'm an introvert. And in introverts, we love to use that excuse, don't we? I'm sorry if you're an extrovert, you haven't got that excuse. Because I was thinking of every extrovert in my life that would just thrive in that environment. They would love it there, they would love the engagement, they would love talking with people. I'm this introvert from a middle-class Christian community that I felt didn't fit there and I was uncomfortable. So I was trying to use these excuses with God of I'm an introvert, there's other people to do that. And he didn't, this excuse didn't fly with him, unfortunately. And so then I'm thinking of other excuses like, I can't relate to these people. I haven't had an addiction, never used drugs, never been drunk. Like all of those reasons of I don't relate. I've never experienced homelessness. I had no lived experience when it comes to them. I knew no people in my life that had that experience. And so for me saying to Jesus, actually I have nothing in common with them, Jesus. Find someone else with lived experience. And unfortunately, that one didn't fly either. Because do you know what he responded with? He responded telling me all of the people that he used to hang out with. And he had no lived experience with them. He wasn't the rejected. He wasn't a prostitute. He wasn't a tax collector. He wasn't a drunkard. And all the other rejected people that he dealt with. He wasn't any one of them, but he completely related to them. And really, that shifted my life where I realized it's not, nothing to do with me and everything to do with him, that Jesus is my connection point between me and him. Really, the gap between our comfort zone and the uncomfortable is Jesus. He's the one that fills that gap. So we're not supposed to try and come up with all the sort of tools that allow us to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. We're supposed to just put our trust in Jesus. Now, sometimes when you go after those uncomfortable times, like for me, It was months and months, if not years, before I came comfortable in that place. And the moment you start being comfortable is the moment all of the hard stories start coming from the guests and you start being more and more uncomfortable. And then you grow in that place and you become comfortable and the next time you're counselling someone or you're breaking up a fight or things like that and all of these things, God says, actually, you're getting a bit comfortable now. Now's the next step to take. And that's what happened for me. I kept growing in that place, I kept learning, and so for now it is very comfortable for me. I wouldn't say it's still completely comfortable, there's still elements and uncomfortability there, but I know that Jesus is there and he completes that gap and he allows me to relate to them. The reality, if you head down to the crew at all, all you have to do is give some time for someone to be seen and heard and that's enough. It's got nothing to do with food. It's got nothing to do with being relatable. If you sit down and say, hey, how are you going? That's enough and the guests will be completely seen and heard and valued. And that's the same for you being out in any place in your work environment, whether you're in, uh, at the shopping centre, whether it's someone that is broken or someone that seems to have it all together. The biggest thing we can do as believers is to show people value by giving them a listening ear. So I encourage you to do that. I'm going to repeat this again. A Christian can live in comfort. It's another way of thinking of it. A Christian lives in comfort because they are resting in their position as a child of God. A follower of Jesus can't live in comfort because they say, as a child of God, I choose to follow Jesus. Let me say it again. It's easy for us. I give my life to Jesus and I'm cool. I'm in my place of being right before the Father. I'm completely safe. I'm completely comfortable. I am a child of God. And I think that's where Christians end up. They end up in that place and they try and control the environment around them so they get to the end of their life in safety and comfort knowing they're going before the Father in heaven at the end. The reality of what Jesus says, he says, you give your life to me and as a child of God, I get to go and follow into the uncomfortable and I get to walk and wherever Jesus is is where I'm meant to be. I'm not meant to rest as a child of God over there in my Christian Bible and Christian community. Don't get me wrong, we need that because it is uncomfortable. 
to follow Jesus. And we need the support of those around us, and that's why God wants us to live in community. But we're meant to be following Jesus into the uncomfortable. I think that is really repentance at its heart. Repentance is about a change of direction. So repentance is not, I've gone from my way, and now I give my life to Jesus and I'm right before him. That's forgiveness. Repentance is going from my way to forgiveness to going Jesus' way. It's about going a different way. So if there's anything you ever come to repent for, maybe you get prayer for something or in your quiet time with God and you're repenting over something, remember it's a change of direction. You can't stand in forgiveness. It's going a different way. So I was walking one way that was wrong, and now I'm forgiven. Now I'm going to walk the opposite way. I'm going to make the enemy pay for everything that happened in that place. Prayer. What do you think prayer is for? Prayer in its essence is really time with God. That can be sort of dedicated time. You're in a prayer closet if you've got one of those. Um, It can be on your drive, wherever you are. It's communication with God. It's time with God. It was always meant to position us towards pursuing Jesus. Prayer is meant to position our hearts towards pursuing here. The reality, if I spend time with God, it's going to make me more like Jesus, more in love with him, more in pursuit of him. Prayer is meant to reorientate our hearts towards him. Prayer positions us to pursue the uncomfortable. It gives us the strength. It gives us the wisdom. It gives us the strategy. It gives us the knowledge of what the next step is. Prayer positions our heart to say yes to following Jesus completely. So if you're in a time of prayer and you think it's just to throw your request up to God, I think you've got it wrong. I encourage you to spend time with God saying, would you change my heart, God? Would you make it more like yours? Would you give me that essence, that urge within me to pursue you with everything I have, that is what prayer is meant to be. It's supposed to reorientate us towards pursuing Jesus. Now, Jesus speaks of this difference between pursuing comfort, pursuing our own desires, and pursuing him. He speaks of this in Matthew 16. It's on the screen. Matthew 16, 21 to 25. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. At the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. All of a sudden, we know he's got it wrong, haven't we? Peter thinks he can rebuke Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He's a character, isn't he? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. What a zinger, isn't it? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God. Listen up but merely human concerns. Then Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What was Peter doing? He was operating from his own desires. He was operating from his place of comfort. What do I want out of this? I want Jesus by my side. And so Jesus, I mean, Peter rebukes Jesus and say, never, Lord, that's never going to happen to you. And what does Jesus respond with? Actually, you're thinking selfishly. You're thinking human concerns. You're thinking comfort. And you're thinking your own safety. And he boldly, Jesus boldly corrects him, basically rebukes him and says, you're thinking selfishly. You're thinking your own things. But I want you to start thinking my way. The reason Peter went into that place of comfort because he wanted, he wanted Jesus with him. He wanted comfort. He didn't want to live in the uncomfortable knowing what was ahead for Jesus. And so he tries to correct him. And then Jesus responds by saying, hey, if you're trying to keep your life, if you're trying to stay in comfort, if you're trying to keep your own desires, if you're trying to operate from that place of what you want, then you're going to completely lose your life. The moment I stay in comfort is the moment I lose my life. 
I wonder if that's why we're not seeing the expansion of the kingdom in our city and region and nation and the world because all of us as Christians have stayed in our comfort zone with our own human concerns rather than the concerns of God. I wonder if that's the case. The moment I try to save my life by staying in comfort is the moment Jesus says I lose my life. It is selfish desire, it is what, I, what is my need, what is my desire, what is my comfort, what do I want to happen? And so it's time we change our thinking to say, and that's really in prayer, give me your thoughts, give me your desires, Jesus. What is it you want for my life? Now this idea of following Jesus in the uncomfortable, I said it happens throughout Scripture. I'm going to quickly jot down about eight or so people that came to mind as I think of those that said yes to Jesus in their pursuit of the uncomfortable. Here's some people. Noah. Think of Noah and the glorious ark that gets to sail on the water with all the animals and his family. If you think of the lead up into Noah and the ark, that God comes and says, hey Noah, it's time to build an ark. It's going to be a massive flood on the earth. Why would Noah believe God for that? Like it was completely opposite to the land he was living in. There was no sign of flood coming. And then also, actually, Noah, you getting into that ark is going to see the wiping out of the whole world full of people. There was nothing comfortable about it. And to Noah, if you think it probably took him years, I'm not sure how long, but probably years to build this ark, the heavy toil that it took for him to build the ark, the ridicule he has get from people. Imagine someone here building a boat. It's like... How are you going to get that to the water? We don't have modern, they didn't have the modern technology that do now. Even just like, how are you going to get it to water? You expect a flood's going to come and it's going to float this boat. Just imagine the ridicule he got. Noah embraced the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. He trusted that God would prove faithful to his word, even though it cost him. Think of Abraham. Abraham gets this word from the Lord. And the Lord says to him, Abraham, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing. You're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to send you from the land that you know and that is your family's land. I'm going to send you to the land that God promises you. And what happens? Abraham boldly goes in the pursuit of the uncomfortable, coming across opposition, coming across wandering aimlessly, coming across... um, being attacked, coming across his, I think it's his brother that gets attacked and held captive. Abraham doesn't see the promise fulfilled, but he boldly goes in the pursuit of the Lord, trusting that the Lord's plans are greater than his. And then he gets this word that says, hey, you're going to be a father of many nations. And what happens? His wife doesn't fall pregnant. And they try and try and try, and nothing is happening. Abraham gets to the point where he's sick of living in the uncomfortable nature of knowing there's a word of the Lord over his life and not seeing that come to pass. So what does he do? He puts it into his own hands. He says, I can do this. I can make this more comfortable for me. And so he goes and has a baby through his servant, Hagar. That's where Ishmael comes from. And what happens is he tried to take things into his own hands. He tried to settle for comfort. I know what I can do rather than trusting what God can do. And then from that place, God redeems that word and speaks it over him again. And his wife Sarah falls pregnant at 99 years of age. They didn't think that would ever happen. God is faithful to his word. It's time that our pursuit of the Lord into the uncomfortable sees those words over our life happen, even though we can't see it for ourselves. Abraham embraced the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. Then we have Esther. Esther becomes the queen and all of a sudden this edict comes out which is going to kill the Jewish people. So she is a Jew. The king doesn't know that she's a Jew. For her to go and approach the, the king without being invited is, um, means that she's going to be killed. And so boldly she embraces that uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord and she goes before him and everything changes and she saves the Jewish people. She was boldly pursuing the word of the Lord in the uncomfortable. Daniel. Daniel is a great story around Daniel. One snippet of that 
is that Daniel, there's this, um, I'm just going to call them edicts, for a better word, edict out that you can't pray to the Jewish God. And Daniel's like, nah, stuff that. And so he goes boldly in the opening of his window and three times a day is praying to the Lord, knowing that means he's going to be killed. Daniel was boldly pursuing the Lord through the uncomfortable. David. Think of David. We think of King David. We think of the, the gallant defeat of Goliath. What happened when Daniel was a teenager? The prophet Samuel comes and speaks to him and says, you're going to be the king of Israel as a teenager. Imagine getting that word. And what happens? He's not appointed king. 15 years later it takes before he's appointed king. And during those 15 years, he is pursued, he is attacked, the king's trying to kill him. Everything you can think of that was uncomfortable for someone's life happened to David. But he boldly pursued the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. He kept faithful. He kept honourable. Many times he had the chance to kill the king that the Lord had appointed. He chose not to. He could have forced his way to be king. But he chose to let the Lord bring that path about. Joseph. Joseph gets a dream. His dream says his siblings and his parents are going to bow down to him. Not sure he was wise. He went and told his siblings. And they weren't very happy about that. And so they go and stick him in a well and they sell him to the slave trade. 14 years between the dream the Lord placed on his life and when he took that position. 14 years. We're tired after about a month, aren't we? But Lord, you said this. 14 years he waits for the Lord to fulfill his promise spoken over him. Think of the prophets. There was lots of prophets in the Bible in the Old Testament. What was the prophets, uh, what did they have to do? They had to go and share uncomfortable words, often to kings or nations, generally words of correction. How uncomfortable is that? Now, I'm glad the Lord doesn't quite work the same now. I'm glad a lot of the words that God speaks to us through prophetic people is words of encouragement and words of destiny. In the Old Testament, it was more words of correction to bring the people back into line. But the prophets, they would pursue the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. They would faithful to what the Lord said, regardless of what happened to them. And the last one I'm going to cover in the Old Testament, Moses. So the Lord speaks to Moses and says, you're going to deliver my Jewish people from captivity in Egypt. And Moses comes up with all those sort of religious excuses. And he's like, oh, but I can't speak and I'm not the right one. And he goes before the Lord many times saying, I'm not the right one to do this. And the Lord says, you are the right one. And he brings Aaron along beside him to help him. But the reality is he didn't need Aaron. He just needed to live in that uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. And so what happens is Moses leads the Israelite people out of Egypt they're fleeing, the Egyptian army is chasing them, they go through the Red Sea, the Red Sea collapses on the Egyptian people. And then what happens? They don't walk into the promised land. They walk into 40 years of wilderness, wandering in the wilderness. 40 years of that, daily reliant on the Lord. I wonder if we would see more if we had to daily rely on the Lord. I think that's why we see it happening in our third world nations and we see those under um, persecution. We see the church growing rapidly because they have to daily rely on the Lord. And for us in Western countries in comfort, we seem to not have to do that. So what happens is for 40 years, they're trusting that every day they had to wait for the provision of manna and quail for them to be fed. If they kept anything aside, if they kept anything for it to be comfortable for them to not have to rely on God, everything went moldy and off. They had to daily rely on the Lord. Now we talk about the Holy Spirit as the comforter. He only comforts us if we're uncomfortable. The only time I get to experience the comforter is when I'm uncomfortable. So I wonder if the, why, that's why Jesus said, hey, wait for the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. He's going to be your comforter. 
was the reality of knowing if we're actually pursuing Jesus, we're going to be living a life in the uncomfortable. That's what he has for us. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to make us comfortable. He's not trying to reverse the uncomfortable nature of pursuing the Lord. He makes us comfortable in our uncomfortableness. He doesn't come to override us and put us back into a place of comfort. He comes to comfort us while we're still uncomfortably pursuing the Lord. Then let's look at the disciples. The disciples for three years lived in discomfort. Following Jesus, being rejected. So much so that Peter at the end when Jesus is going to the cross... I think Peter basically gives up and he thinks Jesus has gone. And he's like, nah, stuff this. I'm not living in that uncomfortable anymore. And so three times they say, hey, Peter, aren't you with Jesus? And he's like, no, that's not me. Weren't you one of them, Peter? No, nah, it's not me. I'm not with Jesus. Three times that happens. He would rather go back into his comfortable place where he wasn't attacked rather than stay in the uncomfortable pursuit of the Lord. But what happens is Jesus redeems him. Jesus gives him a chance to come back. And so Jesus dies, rises again, meets up with Peter. And Jesus responds to him three times, Hey, do you love me, Peter? And what does he say? Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Go and do what I was doing. Go and be uncomfortable still in your pursuit of me. Then we have Paul. Paul was one of the greatest spreaders of the gospel. We really see the gospel spread, the kingdom spread because of Paul. He was originally a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. He has this encounter with Jesus. He goes blind. A few days later, he gets his sight back. And he drastically turns his life around in pursuit of the Lord. Paul lived in discomfort his whole life. I'm going to read from a passage in 2 Corinthians. Paul is talking about being uncomfortable here. I'm going to read it and then I'll explain it. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, And being exposed to death again and again, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Have we even done one of those? Isn't that incredible? Now, I want to take you back to the start of that verse. No need to bring it up on the screen. He says this. Are they servants of Christ? What's another way to say that? Are they followers of Jesus? I am more. The way he proves that he is a follower of Jesus, by saying every single thing that made him uncomfortable, everything that he had to endure through. The biggest um, evangelist that we've ever seen that sees the gospel spread, that follows follows Jesus with everything he has, The way he proves that he is a follower of Jesus is by what he endures. And what do we say? I'm a follower of Jesus because I come to church each week or because I have a quiet time each morning or I read the Bible or I like worship. And Paul says as a follower of Jesus, this is what it means. This is what being in the uncomfortable means. I speak this word as a word not of correction, but of encouragement, that there is more. I speak to myself as I speak to you. I love it when the scripture confronts me, and this passage just confronted me this week, because 
the reality is we all settle for some level of comfort, some more than others. We all settle for comfort. But Jesus is saying, actually, I am in the uncomfortable. Jesus is the gap between what I can do and what he's called me to do. Jesus fills the gap of uncomfortability. If I'm only doing what I can do, then I don't need Jesus. I would say the majority of Christians and majority of churches could operate without Jesus ever showing up, unfortunately. But there's more. There is more for all of us. So I say that as encouragement. What are we willing to endure? What level of discomfort are we willing to go through to see, to follow Jesus? Say it again. What are we willing to endure? What level of discomfort are we willing to go through as we follow Jesus? So I end repeating a line that I said earlier. God's presence is the safest place. But safety with him does not translate to being comfortable. You are completely safe with God. But that doesn't mean you are called to be comfortable. I know God has more for each one of you. God has more for each one of you. God has more for our Paradox community. He has more for our Paradox community. And God has more for our city. He has so much more for our city. So are we willing to follow Jesus in a way that makes us uncomfortable? Are we willing to follow Jesus in a way that moves us beyond our comfort zone and needs him to show up? If you can stand, I'm going to pray for us. I want you to know that today, me personally, I'm making a renewed commitment to move beyond my comfort zone and my self-centeredness into those areas of the uncomfortable where Jesus is waiting for me. And so I invite you to do the same. Are you willing to make a commitment today to move beyond the comfort zone that you might live in? To move beyond self-centeredness? To pursue Jesus into those areas of uncomfortable? Because I know Jesus is waiting for all of us in that place. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our great desire. You are our great desire, Jesus. We want nothing more than to see you glorified, to see you get the full reward for your suffering. We want to get to the end of our life and for you to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done for following me with everything that you have. Well done for pursuing me no matter what the cost. And so today, I and those around me that want to make that decision, we make a renewed commitment with you, Jesus. We make a new, renewed commitment to say, yes, we are following you, no matter the cost. We are willing to step out of our comfort zone. We are willing to embrace the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. We are willing to pay any cost. Cost. We are willing to make every sacrifice. We are willing to cost our time and our resources. We're willing to forgo all of those religious excuses that diminish what you have for us. We're willing to step out of our comfortable Christian bubble. And we say that as individuals and we say that as a paradox community. We are willing to embrace the uncomfortable in the pursuit of the Lord. We are willing to break out of convention. We are willing to break out of comfort. We are willing to break out of routine. We are willing to break out of those safety factors that we've had in place. And we say, we trust you, Lord, with our future. We trust you, Lord, with our moment. We trust you, Lord, with our next step. We trust you, Lord, with the next decision. And Jesus, wherever you are is where we want to be. So just like Peter said, Jesus, would you call us to come? And wherever that is, Jesus, we say yes. We make the commitment today to say yes. So I ask that you would open our ears to hear you. 
Would you open our eyes to see you? Would you remind us in every moment of what you're doing? And as we say yes to do, would you reveal yourself to us? That we would see what you're doing in the moments. You would, we would see our role of what to step into. We desire you completely with everything we have. And today we make that renewed commitment to pursue you with everything we have. We say yes to you, Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. You are the greatest thing that has ever happened in our life. You deserve everything. You deserve the highest praise, Jesus. You are glorious and you are wonderful. You are majestic. You are trustworthy, Jesus. You are a great provider and we trust you. We trust you that as we step in the uncomfortable Holy Spirit, that you would come and comfort us. That you would give us the boldness to pursue. You would give us the grace to see things happen through you that we can't do on our own. Again, we say yes to you, glorious Jesus. We repent for the times we've settled for comfort. We repent for the times we've settled for our own way of thinking. We thank you for your forgiveness, but we respond in repentance and we turn towards you and we say yes to you, that we're going to pursue you, we're going to step forward and see the fullness of what you have for our life, to see you fully glorified, Jesus, through our life. We thank you and we praise you that you have chosen us. We thank you that as undeserving as we feel, we thank you that we are deserving before your eyes of having you walk with us, of getting to hang out with you and follow you. We thank you that you've made us deserving and we say yes again. We say yes again, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. May this not be a moment, but may this be a change of direction for our life. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a team up here that would love to pray for you. Brad is going to say something. If you, even if you feel like you just want to do some more repenting before the Lord, uh, you are going to come forward. Or if you need healing, prayer, anything like that. Uh, if you are a parent with kids in Paradox Kids, uh, we're just a couple minutes over time. We'd love for you to go and uh, grab your kids. Even if you're wanting some prayer, either get someone else to pick up your kids or go get them and then you can come back uh, with them. We'd love to, to minister to you. But uh, hey, let's go out and live differently. That's what repentance is. It's that, it's that changing of our perspective, which leads into a changing of how we walk. Um, and if you want to, even like in Greg's journey, put yourself in uncomfortable places. Uh, we've got a whole lot of uncomfortable places that we can send you into. Um, so you can meet Jesus in that place. You know, I, like, I do like to say, you know, we can meet with him in the secret place and we can meet with him in the marketplace because he's absolutely out there uh, desiring to impact the lives of, of the people around us. So we bless you as you go. We send you out as missionaries into uh, the sphere of influence wherever you are out into the world to bring the kingdom of God. So bless you. Love you guys. Have a great week.